thank you so much for coming to this finale of our first ever RE Denver series. Um, as many of you know, I'm Annie Levinsky. I'm the Executive Director of Historic Denver. And we've really enjoyed putting this program on starting last June and running off and on um, over the course of this year. But as we transition to talk to tools, I want to introduce Nicole Malo, who will be followed by Christine Frank um, to talk more specifically about what neighborhoods can do, what our regulatory options may be, and then finally, as a community, how we continue to pursue these ideals. Hello, good evening. Thank you uh, for the introduction, Annie, and thank you all for being here tonight. We really appreciate that you all have been following regarding Denver through the past 10 months and hope you have learned as much as we have about Denver's identity, what makes Denver, Denver. As part of getting to the root cause of our collective discomfort with the changing character of the city, as well as our most favorite and unique community characteristic, we've been collecting data from you all in the form of paper handouts and an online survey called Searching for Denver's Identity. Although we realize most of the followers are, followers are preservationists at heart, the survey did shed light on how people identify with their neighborhoods and what makes it special to them. Overwhelmingly, people identified brick as the most common material and neighborhood characteristic, followed by front porches, trees, front lawns, and a mix of densities and uses. These characteristics were also identified as their favorite neighborhood features, as well as the consistency and rhythm of building setbacks. The number one thing that reminds people of their neighborhoods are the older buildings. Your favorite thing about your neighborhood? It was shared values and pride in your neighborhoods, buildings, and yards. So what makes people want to live in Denver? A sense of place, followed by walkability, which is fostered by human-scale building, a sense of safety, and mixed-use neighborhoods. Most people are generally accepting of the new styles of architecture going up in their neighborhoods. However, only if it was sensitive to the size of the buildings around it existing setbacks, and similar in materials to what is typically found in the neighborhood. Unfortunately, as a few of these images depict, many of these new buildings we see going up are not sen sensitive to the context of the existing buildings on the block. Such forms of context, inconsistent context, include massing and scale of the buildings, inconsistent window patterns, and lack of front entries that give the building a sense of engagement with other buildings and the neighbors around it. Oh, well, only a little bit of that slide showed up. I apologize. As any explained, the purpose of the RE Denver series was not only to provide a forum for discussing the issues around the fast-paced changes in community character that are taking place in our city, but also to provide recommendations for identifying and preserving what we all love about Denver's precious and unique identity. In order to support the principles for enduring Denver, we've also created a toolbox, a how-to for neighborhood organizations and policy regulators, how to make the principles come alive. Although Historic Denver and its partners recognize that preservation districts are a strong tool for encouraging good design, we recognize it's not the only tool we should use to protect our neighborhoods. In fact, research from the National Preservation Green Trust Lab Trust Green Lab shows that the most intact historic districts in the country, including New York and San Francisco, have very few preservation districts. And that, in fact, would be the data that you would be looking at right here. <laughs> there, are, there are cities that expect great community design and refuse to allow low standards for community excellence to penetrate their communities. Oh, look at that. Fancy. 
Consistent with our research and the comments provided by the RE Denver presenters over the last year, surveyors all agree that the best tool to improve architecture and urban design is to support neighborhood-specific guidelines. With what we, have, what we have found is overwhelming agreement that each of De Denver's neighborhoods drums to its own unique beat. Although there are several unifying characteristics of Denver, such as brick, front porches, and tree-lined front yards, neighborhoods are very distinctive. Picture Rhino versus Lodo, and Platt Park versus Cherry Creek or Hilltop. Each one evokes a different sense of place and being when you visit. Further, different types of people are found in these different places. We realize that with over 180 registered neighborhood organizations, we cannot expect that the city has the time nor the resources to create unique neighborhood master plan for each of your neighborhoods within a reasonable time frame. So as a result, we're offering you a small toolbox to neighborhood organizations to empower you to take matters into your own hands. The neighborhood toolbox is designed as a how-to manual to help neighborhood organizations outline, identify, and protect their own unique identity. There are many examples of how existing neighborhood identities are defined. Step one is to gather data. Create your own neighborhood character report. Define your neighborhood boundaries. Do your homework. Has there ever been an architectural survey in the neighborhood? When was your neighborhood first designed and built? Was the historic context of the neighbor what was the historic context of the neighborhood? Who used to live there and what types of industry and businesses used to exist there? Survey the existing building stock. What are the types of residences? Single family, multifamily, duplexes? How many are there of each? What are the types of commercial buildings? Are they offices? Are they mixed use? And where are they located in the neighborhood? Is there a pattern? Map it. Next, categorize the architectural styles found. Are there pre-war, post-war, Tudor style, Denver squares, Victorian? What types of materials do you see? Brick, wood, stucco? Are there consistent building setbacks? What are they? Are there garages, attached or, de or detached? What types of buildings are located on the corners of each intersection? Do all the blocks have alleys? Do the buildings have front porches? Do they have eaves? And most importantly, what is their scale and size? Next step is to use the information learned from your neighborhood building survey to create a pattern book for future development. This will take more technical consulting services, but you'll have the information to put it all together. Further, there are several existing examples, such as Tristana Park's pattern design book. Arvada has several. And Platt Park has one done by um, the National Trust for Historic Preservation to help guide the process. As we move through these steps, please note that the resources needed become more complex in nature. Design guidelines can be your next step. You'll have to be well organized to continue this process, including engaging with the city and other professionals for, the, for their time and expertise. Design guidelines should be very careful to be context sensitive and not architecturally prescriptive. In other words, design guidelines should not be about one architectural style or another, but about fitting into the buildings around it. And finally, form a voluntary civic design committee. The neighborhood toolbox should use all these steps to describe to form a voluntary civic design committee. The committee could be well-rounded with design professionals, architects, and neighbors who meet with potential developers and provide constructive feedback based on the design guidelines. Next, I'd like to introduce Christine Frank from the Center for Research and Traditional Architecture at CU Denver to discuss with you the next steps in the regulatory toolbox. Hello, 
everyone. Thank you, Annie and Nicole. Uh, you two, Historic Denver, and everyone who's been involved in and coming to this forum have done a great job at defining the problem and identifying possible solutions. Among possible solutions to improving the future of our built environment are regulatory tools. These become especially important when market forces prove incapable of producing the kind of city that we want to leave to future generations. To consider some of the different regulatory tools that might help, we should bear in mind that the goal of any of these regulatory changes or additions would be to ensure that the principles Annie has defined are supported. Through what regulations, if any, can we encourage or require making a Denver that is Denver, infilling before we refill, creating shared spaces that serve all, building substance instead of splash, having green spaces that unify our built environment, building new places that have regular pleasing rhythms and relationships, making things which are durable, adaptable, and thus truly sustainable, ensuring that we consider the fine grain, creating adaptable, flexible parking strategies, and ultimately cultivating an ethic of community. Looking at this list, it's pretty clear that many of these areas cannot and should not be handled through regulations, but rather through education, facilitation, and encouragement. But some of these principles can be met through changes to our existing regulations and potentially through the addition of new regulatory tools. Throughout the Ray Denver forums, ideas have bubbled up on regulations in discussions in this room and discussions afterwards. This evening, we'd like to summarize a few issues that might be best handled through regulation and likewise to share some additional regulatory tools that have been suggested. Let's start first from the outset with the idea that we have a very good form-based, context-based zoning code of all of the ideas behind it are just and formed out of a very carefully considered process. However, five years on, well into this recent building boom, we can now measure whether we are getting the city we want from the code we have. In some areas, we clearly are not. Whether this is due to loopholes or unforeseen consequences doesn't really matter. We have to clarify or amend our zoning code to address a few critical issues. Let's look at a few images to identify some of the problems that have cropped up, which we should try to address through amendments to our zoning code. First, the ongoing eating away of the continuity of the street through curb cuts, whether to access garages along side lot lines or garages in the middle of a lot, this needs to stop. And in fact, in the latest bundle, of amendments to the zoning code, it appears that this has been corrected. So this is a positive step forward, except of course for the buildings that have already been permitted and the buildings that have already been built. As a fundamental principle, the integrity of the street edge should be maintained and garages should be accessed from the alley. For example, here is a new project where the garages are accessed from the alley and are located below grade, allowing the ground level of the building in the public realm to remain active and keeping the street and the curb intact. This brings us to the issue of the presence and location of the garage itself. When a building has its living spaces elevated up on the second floor, or in the case of many commercial and multifamily buildings, active spaces being placed on top of six or seven stories of parking, in this case right directly behind Larimer Square, we kill our streets. We create unsafe, dead environments that nobody wants to walk in or be in. Dead zones in the ground plane that are connected to the public realm, i.e. in the front of the buildings, should not be allowed. An entrance feature or a vestibule is not enough, for it might at most be used twice a day. We can create all the density that we want, but if we do not create safe, pleasant walking environments, people will continue to rely on their cars to go everywhere, and a principal goal of density, a vibrant, mixed-use, walkable environment will not be achieved. One possible recommendation is to disallow parking 
as a use by right at street level for a depth of 25 feet along the primary street in Main Street and mixed use zone districts. Parking could be allowed on the rear of a parcel, but not along the primary street. Another possible recommendation is to increase the activation requirement at street level along the primary street, especially in Main Street and mixed use zone districts to increase opportunities for storefronts, offices, lived in rooms along the street level. Next, residences without an entrance facing the public realm are impolite, rude, and altogether bad for our community. This is also an issue with the placement of service access, meters, and other utilities that should not be the first thing we see when we pass by a building. It's like sticking your underpants out on display or something. Buildings should have entrances to units on the street and facing the public realm. Entry gates framing a courtyard apartment building, for example, are a good way to do this. But one minor door at the street level from the entrance into one of the units with all of the other doors located down the side is not enough. Now, this is not a question of us not being able to do this today. There are plenty of new buildings which manage to figure out that the front door of a building should be located on the front of a building facing the public realm. Next, it's clear that there needs to be some kind of fine tuning of the code, whether it's through overlay districts um, or tweaking a bit here and there, that respects the fact that we have different neighborhood characters and scales, which also respect that new three or five story buildings maxing out the footprint and envelope of a site are not compatible with smaller, smaller scale older development like this new approved project on South Quitman Street. As Blueprint Denver is updated, our form-based codes need to be better calibrated. Additionally, allowable building forms need to be made more clear. A slot house is not an apartment house, nor is it a courtyard house, nor is it a series of row houses. The forms that we have suggested in the code, all the beautiful drawings showing uh, what could what new development could look like are good. These are not. They're an embarrassment, lawsuits waiting to happen, and terrible for our communal life for all of the reasons that we've been discussing. So we need to be more clear about what our allowable building forms are. For all of our sakes, too, we need to support policies that encourage demolition through landfill fees that discourage demolition, pardon me, through landfill fees or recycling requirements. And this is possible. In Boulder, for example, they've done it. Whether through tax credits that might incentivize recycling or fees which might discourage demolition, it is essential that we make the real cost of demolition and replacement clear. Annie has already discussed this, but we should bear in mind that the economic cost to the individual owner or developer cannot be our only concern for the greater costs are for our loss of heritage and our environment, and those are costs that our entire community bears. This alone suggests that we should also look for regulatory ways to support building codes that can encourage flexibility and reuse and that provide incentive incentives for adapting old buildings and creating new ones that can demonstrate their future adaptability as well. Of critical importance is that we actually uphold and implement public works recommendations for land uh, dedication and easements along collectors and arterials to ensure that there's adequate room for pedestrian corridors and streetscape amenities. We need to actually implement the guidelines in the 1993 City and County of Denver Streetscape Design Manual, initiate an update to it, consider amending current landscape and streetscape development standards so that they better reflect the intention of the guidelines, especially for residential, single family, and duplex projects that are being built in predominantly single family districts. Now, a final suggestion on a possible regulatory way to produce more pleasing outcomes than we're currently getting in Denver Without unduly burdening our official bodies or adding costs for developers, which after all, just get passed along to 
you and me in the end, uh, would be for our registered neighborhood organizations and zoning advisory boards to explore the idea of if a neighborhood were to adopt neighborhood plans or a pattern book or design guidelines and review, as Nicole has just suggested, that they would then be setting a clear standard of what they would accept and recommend for approval. So some form or idea of expedited reviews or pre-approvals could actually reward developers for meeting a community's established standards. I would just say finally that you know, when we think of the role of history, we think of it as something that is receding into the past. Historic Denver, however, and other very enlightened preservationists are recognizing that our history is our future and that our future may be found in our past. So to build our best future, we should consider what regulations can help us do that and implement them. Thank you, Christine and Nicole. Um, you've both been great advisors on this as we've worked through these issues over the last several months. Uh, the final item um, in our toolbox really relate to what we can do in terms of a community-wide effort to implement the principles. And really the first one is to continue the conversation. As some of you know, uh, Dennis Humphreys, a former Historic Denver board member, um, was really the, um, the inspiration for the series. And his goal was simply that we have a place where we could have real conversations about the issues, that we could come to understand them, that we could talk constructively about them, um, and learn from one another. We know that some of these issues, for example, some of the regulatory tools can be pretty complex. And if we can't have opportunities to talk together about whether they are good solutions and how they may work, um, it's going to be very difficult to achieve them. So Historic Denver is committed to continuing the Regarding Denver series. We hope to begin again in the fall and have a 2016-2017 series. We'll take on a variety of different kinds of topics. Of course, there will always be an undertone and thread about our historic environment and our historic buildings, because that is who we are. Uh, but we also want to welcome different ways of thinking about it and the way that we look at our city at large. We also want to encourage continued advocacy and awareness. Historic Denver will continue its work, but as I mentioned in the introduction, we know that this is going to take a variety of partnerships. We already have some great partners in the Denver community, uh, from CARTA to the APA to the Denver Architectural Foundation, and we hope to continue to cultivate those um, and to build new advocacy and positive reinforcement. And so I, I probably should have let Christine announce this, but Christine has launched uh, Denver the City Beautiful Facebook page. Uh, we know the Fugly Facebook page, which I'm sure some of you follow, has brought some important conversations as well. Uh, but we felt like it was important to also emphasize and provide examples of what is going well and to explain what those things are. And so um, Christine and Historic Denver and others will begin to populate this, and we hope you'll um, find it and, again, try to connect with the issues. And then finally, we want to build a coalition. Uh, nonprofit organizations and our partners will, will do our part, but we hope that the community and you as individuals will also um, use your voices. And so we have handed out a list of the principles, and if you support them and agree with them, we hope that you will sign on to be a part of the coalition, something that we can present to our civic leaders when we're talking about these issues um, and share with other communities as well as they are learning. So I hope you'll fill out that form. Of course, we also would welcome you as members of Historic Denver, because that makes it possible for us to continue to do this work. But that's not required. Um, so what 